All right, very good. So uh, we've survived another week. Huh? Isn't that something? We're a week closer to, I don't know, seeing our friends again and leaving the house one week at a time. All right. So um, I guess before we start to, oh, weird Zoom uh, issues out of focus. Cool. Um, we'll call that artistic blur and, and go with it. Uh, before we start today, I wanted to remind you um, that we are um, about two weeks away from um, hearing uh, about your project proposals, your research project proposals. And so just to remind you what the expectation is here, um, I hope that you will get to do an actual research project and write an actual research paper or, um, or close to one over the course of the semester. And um, I hope that you will give a short kickoff, kickoff presentation in, I don't know, a couple of weeks or so. Um, you, can, you can see the schedule on the website. Um, and uh, I mentioned this in the beginning, I really want this class to align with your actual research um, so that you can actually sort of um, take stuff you learn here, including feedback from me, and apply it directly to stuff that you're working on at the moment. Um, that means um, while uh, I'm perfectly happy if you sort of uh, you know uh, get double credit for research that you do elsewhere, like in your actual program, and use that for the class, that's totally fine. That aligns with the goals of the class. I do, however, want this to be research that you're you're doing at the moment or you're you're planning to do at the moment or shortly rather than research that you've done already, right? So just don't just sort of use, uh, I don't know, a, a research paper or whatever that you've already submitted and, and call, that, um, call that done. Uh, I, I really want this to be sort of a work in progress thing so that we can actually iterate on the thing together and then improve it together. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And let's see, what else? Oh, uh, I really have to do something about this camera. It's driving me crazy. Um, how about more light this way? That did absolutely nothing. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, um, or, or to check or to remind you is that if you, um, if this doesn't fit for you at the moment, if you don't have a research project that you're working on or just starting, just about to start or have barely just started right now uh, so that this could align well with what you're doing or planning on doing soon, um, that's fine too. Um, I, I have ideas for stuff that uh, you could work on for research projects that you could work on. I even have some cool data sets that you could use as a starting point for your exploration. So you could sort of start from a, like a pre-assembled data set and build your own research project and research questions and so on and answer them uh, using that. And you could add to that uh, if you'd like. If you'd prefer to do that, that's, that's totally fine. And that's an option. Just sort of talk to me, I don't know, uh, either in class or outside of class about options and I'll give you some ideas and inspiration. Uh, and if you wanna do something else altogether, that's fine too. Just you know, uh, check in with me before you, you put in a lot of uh, time and, and work into something. This is driving me crazy. Please just focus. It's not too much to ask, just focus. So, okay, so I don't know. I'm not gonna win this one, I guess. Uh, all right, any, any thoughts or questions on the project or the process for that? Ask them now while I'm in focus. Who knows how long you will be able to see me. Okay, we leave, we leave that aside then and talk about it um, offline or later more. So the plan for today, what I'd like to do is um, talk in some depth about a particular research method for, for data collection, uh, specifically interviews. Um, and I want to sort of go over some of the nitty gritty details of how to design and conduct interviews. And hopefully we'll have time to play with an actual interview guide to kind of uh, develop one together uh, in class at the end. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. So that's the plan for, for today. Uh, and we're going to continue this on Thursday. We're going to talk about kind of the second half of this 
which is um, analyzing this data that you will be collecting through through interviews. So how to do that rigorously and uh, how to build theory from that. Um, and we're going to look at some more example papers um, that uh, illustrate all of these things. Yeah, so that's the idea for this week. Um, by the way, uh, side note, you probably remember from the schedule I posted at the beginning, we're kind of going through this progression, uh, kind of starting with uh, more qualitative research methods. Um, uh, and so then following on with the more quantitative ones, because I think it aligns well with um, um, kind of how you uh, would often approach uh, mixed methods empirical research study that starts with maybe some broad open-ended questions and so narrows down to specific hypotheses and, and uh, tests of those and so on. So that's, we're kind of uh, following along the, the structure that I laid out uh, at the beginning. All right, so interviews uh, are maybe the most common method of data gathering in qualitative research. Um, it's, uh, it's one of these things that uh, I think you will see by, by the end of this. Um, it's really hard to get right. Uh, seems really easy at, uh, on, on the surface, but it's really hard to get right. Um, and um, it's also very powerful. It's very, very useful. It's a very um, powerful technique uh, when applied correctly. Right. So um, as probably you're expecting, as with everything else, there's a variety of, of forms of research interviews. Um, here's sort of one way to think about them, kind of uh, organized along different dimensions. Um, one dimension you could think of is about the questions you're asking uh, through these interviews. So do you, so on the one end of the spectrum, you, uh, you can think of very specific, very focused, very narrow questions that you're asking. You wanna find out something, something very specific about, I don't know, um, uh, how you, um, um, reviewed literature in order to write the blog post for, for Thursday for, for homework for class, right? So something very specific like this. Or they could be very, very general uh, things. So, you know, your outlook on, uh, I don't know, um, the pandemic or whatever it might be. So how specific or general the questions are is one dimension to, to think about, to take into consideration. Another dimension is the order in which you're asking questions. Like typically there's more than one question um, in an interview um, and you can sort of either predefine this order uh, and have it be fixed ahead of doing the interviews or it could be something that evolves naturally organically throughout the interview uh, and throughout each individual interview. It may also even uh, so change and evolve from one interview to the next in terms of what questions you decide to include and, and exclude and so on. So uh, another dimension here is the order in which you're asking these questions. Um, another dimension still is about maybe uh, precision versus sort of open-endedness of the responses. All right, so do you uh, expect very precise uh, responses to your questions, like 42, uh, or do you expect sort of open-ended uh, answers to your questions, like how, how, you know, how do you collaborate uh, with your uh, fellow classmates when you're uh, doing homework for, for this class or something? Or uh, how do you collaborate? Uh, how do you think about uh, privacy when you're surfing the internet? Things like this, so very open-ended things. Yeah, so this is sort of one way to, to think about these. And you could have sort of uh, interviews that fall anywhere uh, on this spectrum. Um, probably um, the one, uh, the kind of interviews that you'll be encountering most frequently throughout your research in sort of technical fields and computer science uh, are the semi-structured interviews. So that um, I sort of tried to um, like doodle where those would fall on the spectrum. Um, questions are sort of maybe more towards the specific side. They're not they're not super general. Um, the order, there's certainly some order, right? They're not completely uh, sort of organic and, and ad hoc. There's some order and some predefined uh, questions and, and so some topics that you really want to touch upon in the interviews and that you care about. Um, but it, it can change a little bit, right? So it's not sort of a, a fixed structure, it can evolve. Um, and uh, like often you do this 
uh, to uh, collect open-ended answers, uh, responses to your questions, right? So rather than so sort of very precise ones, there's maybe easier um, um, techniques, methods that you could use to collect so sort of more precise answers like uh, surveys and questionnaires and things like this than, than interviews. But it doesn't mean um, you can't do that. I'll, I'll get back to this in a minute. So when to consider doing interviews at all? Like what's the, what's the point of this? Um, well, so they're actually really um, cool when you're doing anything exploratory. So if you're kind of at the um, beginning of a research project and or at the beginning stage of knowledge on some research problem, they're wonderful tools for kind of exploring the problem space. Um, they can help you um, form theories and derive hypotheses um, and so sort of follow those up with, with other methods later on. Um, and that's why you'll also see that they're very common in mixed methods uh, designs. You'll see sort of people doing interviews at the beginning of a um, mixed method study and you'll see them sort of following that up with, with other methods afterwards. So for example, testing hypotheses that have been derived through this interview. Um, and just as an anecdote, they are a wonderful way to validate data. This is sort of not the typical use case of, of interviews, but it's one that comes up very, very often in the kind of research that, uh, that we do in my group and, and some of you might do as well. Uh, the research that sort of involves uh, collecting and analyzing data of sorts. So let me share an anecdote. This is one of my favorite anecdotes. This is from um, a researcher at Microsoft Research, Christian Bird. And he talks about how uh, he was working on this research project, investigating the latency of code reviews at Microsoft. So why do code reviews take as long as they take at Microsoft? And uh, I guess uh, the goal was to uh, think of or come up with ways to speed that up. And he was doing this by analyzing data from the sort of history or activity logs of, of all the code reviews they've had inside Microsoft. And one thing Chris noticed is that many of the code reviews and the data that he had collected were signed off in just minutes and often under a minute after the code review was created. And this made no sense because it would take a lot longer than that to you know, even read the, the code itself. And so think about it and type up uh, review comments and things like this. So it's just completely implausible that, that this would occur. So Chris did the, the natural thing that uh, I would have done, that uh, sort of a, a data-driven person uh, would have done, and have tried to debug uh, this extensively. And he went over all of his data collection scripts and all of his data and conducted a bunch of statistical tests to figure out kind of what was going on and why this was occurring and so on, and couldn't find any mistake in any of these things. Right, so it was still so this phenomenon that was very strange was uh, was unexplainable uh, still. So that's uh, as a last resort. He talks about this. He decided to uh, interview one of the developers on on the team um, and talk about uh, sort of their code review process. And it turns out what was happening is that uh, people would often gather in person together to do these code reviews uh, as a sort of live conversation as part of a meeting uh, and uh, so sort of have this happen, all of this happen offline. And only at the end of this discussion and, and meeting and so on, when folks were, uh, were happy with the outcome and the next steps and whatnot, uh, that somebody would enter the request in the review system and the reviewers would immediately sign off on this because they had already discussed everything offline. Okay, so this is a great example of how um, he um, you know, could have saved himself many hours of, of, of stress and, uh, I don't know, uncertainty uh, and um, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, uh, being puzzled about this weird artifact he had observed in his data, he could have saved himself hours if he had just thought of, of doing this from the beginning. Uh, and the, the conclusion was that you can learn things in an interview that you would have maybe never thought of yourself. So I, I, I keep this as a nice anecdote to, uh, to share with, with folks because I can relate to it myself. I, this happens to me all the time and uh, happens often to my students, I, I'm sure. Um, all right, as an aside, we talked about how 
you probably do interviews as part of qualitative research, but it doesn't mean you can't do interviews in quantitative research. So, um, for example, you could imagine essentially having a uh, some survey instrument or questionnaire that you ask somebody to fill in live uh, as part of an interview, right? So, I I could ask you all to fill in a questionnaire. Uh, as part of this uh, Zoom call, and so that would essentially count as an as an interview. I would I would ask you a, a series of questions in a in a predetermined order, and you would sort of give very precise, perhaps numerical answers or Likert skills uh, type answers to those questions, and that's also technically an interview. Uh, it's just sort of not the typical uh, kind. Um, so you know, don't don't just assume that um, interview means qualitative and sort of not interview means, I don't know, quantitative or something. You, you could have it uh, either way. Um, all right, yeah, so I guess more on the same, the idea is that um, in a, so the previous example of a quantitative research style interview, the interviewee is just the research subject. This is somebody that you're collecting data from, uh, whereas, um, with a qualitative research style interview, the interviewee is a research participant. So it's not, it's not a subject, but a participant. It's a completely different mindset. That means um, you're, uh, you and the participant, the participant is actively shaping the course of the interview together with you, uh, rather than passively responding to your predetermined questions. Okay. All right, so um, what are the main goals and characteristics of these uh, qualitative style interviews. I'm gonna be focusing uh, on, on these qualitative style research interviews uh, throughout the rest of the lecture, because these are the ones that I think you'll be um, using and encountering most often in your, in your research. Rather than the quantitative style interviews, we're gonna talk more about surveys and questionnaires in a, in a future lecture. So the goal, the main goal um, of interviews is to see some topic from the perspective of the interviewees. It's kind of to, to put yourself in their shoes, if you will, um, and to understand how and why they've arrived at that particular perspective and, and view of the phenomenon you're studying, right? Um, so it's kind of to see the world, the problem, the whatever through their eyes is the, is the main goal of these style of interviews. Um, and that means that you know, to achieve this, you typically have a relatively low degree of structure imposed by the interviewer, right? So you're, uh, you're letting the participants kind of take you in, in, in that direction, right? You can't really anticipate and you shouldn't overimpose your, your worldview, your perspective uh, onto them. You should sort of you know, have them take you along for the ride and, and kind of uh, help you see their perspective rather than the other way around. So, relatively little structure imposed by you, the researcher, the interviewer. Um, and the way you achieve this is with pri uh, primarily open-ended questions, right? So rather than asking, you know, what's the meaning of the uh, universe in, in you responding 42 uh, or something, uh, I, you know, would ask you much more open-ended questions than, than that. And you kind of, you know, t tell me a story, walk me through your uh, experience and, and so on. Um, one thing that's really important here is that you try to focus these on specific situations, events, action sequences, what have you, emphasis on specific, concrete, um, that they have experienced themselves rather than something abstract and more general. Why do you think that is? Why does that sound important or, or does it? I think, I think it's because you want to be able to make sure that you could collect similar data across multiple participants so that you can measure some effect. If you're just asking for general abstractions, it can be kind of hard to get answers to the measurable answers to questions rather than individual opinions. But remember, the goal is not to get measurable answers. The goal is to see the world through their eyes, not to measure 42. Oh, yeah, I missed that. Um, 
let's see some, someone else why do you think why do you think this sort of why am i insisting on this point about uh sort of specific situations and action sequences and events and so on concrete things rather than more general opinions why why am i insisting on this uh, possibly because for um, more specific situations, uh, the person that you're interviewing will give more detail and they'll have a better recollection. Whereas if it's something general, um, you'll also get sort of very general answers and maybe something in the past. So yeah, you generally get better data with more specific uh, questions. Mm. Yeah, I think you're going in the right direction. It, it's really because you can't trust people to, to be honest about anything. They would make stuff up Okay, so e even this is sort of subject to lots of biases. We're going to talk more about that uh, later on. But um, so, you know, the best you can hope for is to talk to people about something specific and concrete and ideally recent and that they've experienced themselves and so on and so forth, so that you sort of reduce the risk that they make stuff up. Okay, it's because they'll just lie to you. Has anybody seen the show? Um, House MD, do you know do you know what this? Mm -hmm. It's like a diagnostician, is that a word? That would never meet the patients that would come to, to see him um, because he would just assume that anything he would uh, they would tell him would be lies and they, he couldn't trust any of the information he'd collect from the participants, from the from the uh, patients themselves, but rather he would sort of um, collect all of these sort of independent clues about what had happened, uh, what had caused their illness. That's sort of a, uh, I don't know, a, a good anecdote to illustrate this, right? Um, the, the best hope you can have for collecting some you know, truthful accounts of, of experiences is if you focus on some more specific and, and uh, concrete things rather than uh, more general opinions. Uh, people will just tell you what you want to hear is, is the point, uh, rather than kind of what, the, um, what they actually think or what they felt or what they've experienced. They will only tell you what you want to hear. So there will, there will be very little value in the data you will be collecting unless you, unless you sort of try to focus more, uh, more narrowly on things that are concrete. Okay, um, so general pros of interviews. One, they uh, allow for rich engagement and follow-up questions. So like think of, uh, for example, an interview as opposed to a survey or a questionnaire. Um, you, you know, even if it's an open-ended question to a survey uh, that you sort of type in or you write up, maybe I, uh, as the researcher, you know, th there's something I misunderstood. Maybe, uh, I don't know, there's some lots of follow-up questions I would want to ask based on what you wrote there, but I don't get a chance because I, you know, I only get to survey you once or something, right? Whereas here you have this, uh, it's a conversation, you're sitting down or whatever, Zooming with somebody and you can have this sort of rich uh, engagement with them and, and so follow up and so on. So this is, it's unbeatable in that sense. It's very hard to, to match this with any other method, this sort of level of uh, engagement and richness. Um, you can also collect uh, data that is maybe not recorded anywhere else. So in that sense, it's very useful because um, it might just be your only hope of, of learning uh, about what had happened uh, because there's no other records of this. It's maybe the only way to study something. It's um, right. So this, I, we talked about this a little bit, but the first point, you typically uh, get richer information, richer detail from your interviewees when you have a conversation with them uh, as compared to when they would just write things up uh, through written communication. People tend to be more concise in writing than um, they would through the sort of uh, back and forth conversation with follow-up from you. Um, and it's, it's also great because the, you don't have to if you, if you have other sources of information that you could use to triangulate whatever you're finding or learning from your interviews, you can certainly do this. You're, uh, you needn't be restricted to the information uh, you collect from, from interviews. So it's great that they're very amenable to mixed methods designs uh, this way, our triangulation being one strategy to, to combine methods. We're gonna talk more about that later. 
Um, okay, yeah, and, and finally, they can be used to clarify things that have already happened, uh, especially following an observation and the uh, Microsoft research anecdote from uh, a couple of minutes ago was a good example of that. Those were general pros. There's also general cons. Remember the, um, I guess, the punchline of this class, all methods are flawed, but uh, I guess you know, some are useful, um, arguably. That's the same here, all methods are flawed. So uh, this one is not without its flaws either. Some general cons, usually uh, you can only interview a small sample of participants, just because it, you will see that it takes a really long time to, to do interviews. So it just will be unfeasible to interview too many. And as we read some example papers, you will see sort of typically, you'll see what typical ranges or so sort of numbers of participants are for interviews. Yeah. Right, the time required to do this, it takes a long time to set up, it takes a long time to schedule, it takes a long time to, you actually have to have this conversation that takes, you know, a half an hour to an hour at least, uh, at least half an hour typically, you uh, have to then transcribe and analyze all of this data so that's a huge uh, time investment, it's just expensive to do, it's rich information but really sort of expensive to do. Um, Right, we talked about this. It could be hard to find interviewees and schedule these. Um, it's also maybe more subjective than other methods. There's all kinds of biases that the researchers, the interviewers can introduce in the data that is being collected this way. Um, things that, so even subtle things like the, the words you choose or the tone of your voice or your body language or, you know, if, if I'm if I'm in an interview with you and I'm checking my watch every other minute, you know, kind of signaling that I can't wait for this to be over or something, you know, you're kind of conveying signals. Remember, we talked about signaling before, conveying signals to your uh, participants that may bias their uh, answers and the data that you're collecting and are, are known to do that. Um, do, yeah. um, Please, uh, do you sort of want? the interviewer to be the same person for every interview I'm kind, of, I'm kind of wondering if you could avoid this bias by just having multiple interviewers if say multiple authors so i guess um so for example the checking your watch bias is not eliminated by having multiple interviewers because they could both be or all be checking their watches right so um that maybe even makes it worse but i um yeah so there's okay so there's nothing preventing you from having multiple interviewers or so researcher researchers participating in interviews we have often done um interviews with a couple of people sort of a couple of interviewers interviewing the participants um I guess the one thing that I'd be mindful of is uh, you know, creating this uh, impression of, I don't know, a panel of, a panel of examiners or something kind of grilling you. So, you know, it may be more intimidating, maybe harder for somebody to be honest and sort of engage with the interviewer. If there's like a, a bunch of people yeah. listening in, that, you know, especially if somebody's just quiet and like taking notes this entire time, that's like really, you know, would stress me out immensely. Like if you have somebody sitting in the background taking notes while you're saying something, it's like, you know, what are they writing? What did I say? Like, how are they going to use that against me? Right. So, like, you know, so think of all of these just sort of interhuman communication issues that could arise um, by by this being a sort of yeah, I was sort of imagining a thing like you take half, I'll take half, and we'll all get these and we'll all do these interviews. This might, you know. That's perfectly fine and that happens. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes. So yeah, you can you can divide up the work and um, so do these independently and just, just analyze the data together afterwards. Yes. Okay, so this was sort of high level things, uh, kind of looking at general characteristics and whatnot. Uh, and I want to dive a little bit into the, the details of these uh, with some best practices and, and less good practices, uh, things to avoid. So roughly um, five steps here to conducting interviews. Like obviously you start by defining some research question 
And again, uh, this is not about quantifying individual experience. Typically, this was uh, a comment from earlier. Uh, the kinds of research questions for which interviews tend to be a good data collection method do not tend to be the kind where you're sort of seeking to quantify things, but rather the kind where you're um, seeking to um, see the world, view the world through the uh, eyes of the participants, um, make, sense, make sense of some particular aspect of their lives, understand some particular uh, experience or problem better, but so not, not quantify things typically. Um, and obviously it's important to um, avoid reflecting your own presuppositions and, and biases in the interviews, but that's the research questions part. Um, next thing you have to do to actually do interviews is create an interview guide. This also goes by the name of an interview protocol. You could, you could sort of encounter that uh, referred to in, in, in both ways. So that's essentially the kinds of things, the script, if you will, the kinds of things you'll be talking about in the interview. So I have to think about this in advance. You have to recruit participants, of course, um, actually engage with them and carry out the interviews and you're collecting data and you have to analyze it um, somehow. So these are roughly the steps. We talked about research questions before. I'm not gonna go back to that here. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the analysis side of this qualitative data later, um, next time probably. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into that either. I'm gonna focus on the middle steps here, the ones that have to do with the actual interview. So first off, how do you create the interview guide? Like, What does this look like? So um, here, you remember this is not a formal with semi-structured interviews the interview guide is not a formal uh, fixed uh, schedule of questions to be asked in word for word in exactly that order uh, to your participants to every participant this is not that but more more as a uh, guidelines if you will so you should list the topics the researcher should attempt to cover in the interviews. And you can even have some examples, questions, if you will, but they needn't be uh, spelled out in, in every word. Um, and in addition, you sort of typically want to list some probes, some sort of follow-up questions, right? So like, how do you, what are the other kinds of things, right? So once you've like, opened up a, a topic, what are the follow-up questions that you might uh, ask your uh, participants to get more information, a little more detail from them about that particular topic. So probes is a technical keyword here. Just remember the, the use of that term. Um, and I mentioned this, the guides can evolve. They can evolve uh, after every interview. So for example, you could add probes to your guides um, and, and topics that have emerged spontaneously in some of the interviews you've already conducted, right? So maybe something interesting that you did not anticipate at all. And that's sort of the point of doing interviews to kind of learn about things that you didn't anticipate already. Uh, something comes up from your first few interviews. So, you know, you uh, add uh, some topics and probes to your guide to cover those and, and the next interviews. Or you could drop some if you're like not getting any useful information from your participants about some of the things you asked. There's no point in like torturing the remaining participants that you're planning on interviewing with the same topics if you're not getting anything useful out of this. So I, I guess the one thing that is important to realize here is that um, with something like interviews and qualitative data analysis, these things, so the data collection and the data analysis tend to happen somewhat in parallel and they tend to influence each other. With something like, I don't know, quantitative data analysis of some existing data set, um, it's more often the case that you first do data collection, you compile a data set, and sort of only once all of that is finished, you do analyses on the data set itself. But here you can see how sort of analysis and data collection can happen in parallel and they influence each other. Uh, and that's sort of, that's the point. That's part of the process that's uh, you, it's supposed to be like this. Um, okay, yeah, so here's kind of what, uh, like a rough, sketch of what a guide might look like uh, you know, starting like obviously you know introductions and kind of background about the research study and things like that um, but you start from maybe more open-ended questions um, and you kind of dive 
deeper into each of those topics with, with follow-ups, with probes, uh, and you sort of branch out again towards the end of the interview uh, and you try to ask about things that maybe you should have asked about or, or things that the participants want to mention that you haven't thought of asking about already. Um, right, so you know, is there, any, is there anything you'd like to add or is there anything we missed or is there anything else I should have asked you uh, and I haven't already, right? So you kind of branch out again uh, and open up new topics, for example. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that you could then take as input for your next rounds uh, of interviews and add to your guide for, for subsequent ones. Um, oh yeah, and don't forget to express some appreciation of people's participation and time and input at the end of this. Uh, it's often forgotten, but it's very nice to acknowledge that people have provided you with useful information and have taken the time to participate in this and have helped you out. So it's nice to uh, acknowledge their help. All right, so you can see this general uh, hourglass structure here. Um, all right, so I guess in practice, what this means is that you uh, will see a lot of, sort of open-ended information seeking questions, followed up with specific probes to dive deeper into um, the interview's views and experience in, in more depth. Um, and uh, we mentioned this already, you will see that people prefer or good interview guides um, focus on concrete examples rather than abstracted generalities for the reasons mentioned earlier. Um, and you see that guides rarely include fully formed questions and often include just topic headings. Um, because like as a side effect, by the way, as a side effect, this makes the whole experience more natural and it encourages you, the researcher, the interviewer to be more responsive and natural and engaging with the participants uh, during the interview itself, rather than feel scripted and, and unnatural. Anything on the guide so far? Okay, so um, somebody has to participate in this, presumably. How do you recruit participants and what are the things you think about when recruiting participants? So here are some considerations. Uh, one, how much time do you have? How many, for example, interviewers do you have? Like if it takes, you know, N hours to uh, do one interview, transcribe it, analyze it, whatever, you know, what are, how many resources do you have available? How many grad students do you have and how much time do they have to spend on this? The, um, that's kind of will, will have a big impact on how many people you can interview. That's one consideration. Another one is um, the, the amount of diversity and the views you expect to, to get. Um, and that has to do with kind of how you put up, put together your, your sample of uh, interviewees. And this sort of varies, it depends on the design for which the interviews are being used. But here are some sampling strategies that are common. For example, you could think of uh, identifying and interviewing typical users of something, a typical case, right? So what does a typical case of something look like? Right? This is sort of an you know, average user of something, an average, I don't know, whatever it might be. And those would be uh, sub participants you would want to recruit for your, um, for your study. Or maybe in addition, you're also interested in sort of the extremes. Um, maybe there's like, uh, I don't know, the two ends of the spectrum. Maybe we're thinking of, I don't know, um, you're interviewing uh, researchers about their um, research productivity um, and you want to also include researchers with extremely high and maybe extremely low productivity in your sample. Maybe they sort of have had different experiences and have different insights about what has contributed to that. I, I don't know. Uh, but you can see how um, including sort of the extreme cases here might provide you with different information and there's, there's some underlying reason why you might want to include them. There's something that's deliberate about um, learning about their experiences, about, about including them. Critical cases sort of similar idea, um, sensitive cases, similar idea. Um, convenience is maybe a very common strategy you see. So for example, a lot of the research papers you will see in uh, computer science that involve interviews 
or lab studies uh, also um, are done with student participants uh, and that's for convenience reasons uh, even you know you if you've built a tool or whatever uh, and you want to interview some um, users of, of your tool you are likely going to have an easier time recruiting from among your peers at cmu than uh, among i don't know random strangers on the internet right so that's a strategy that is often seen in practice typically the default the preferred strategy and a very good default in most cases right so if you're kind of in doubt about how to sample uh, a good default is always to sample for maximum variation like again the point is not to quantify things but rather to i don't know um, describe the the universe of things that are that are possible um, so like sampling for maximum variation and the uh, opinions and experiences of people is a good sort of way to try to get uh, this diversity of, of views um, and information. Okay, and right, so that should allow your uh, more of your readers to connect to something that um, that they're reading in your in your study in your paper because chances are higher that their views are also so sort of represented among this more varied, more diverse sample. So what? When in doubt, sample for maximum variation is the point here. All right, so how many do you sample? So there's two, <clears throat> two criteria, excuse me. One is um, sufficiency, meaning that this is, think of this <clears throat> as the analog of uh, I don't know, like random sampling in um, more quantitative studies. So uh, you want to sample enough participants to have um, all of their, or uh, most of their possible uh, views represented in your sample. So your, your sufficient diversity of views in your sample. And I guess, how could you, how could you think about this? Like, what would that mean? Like, how do you know ahead of time? How might you know ahead of time how many of these um, possible views there are or what are the important variation points? You might try an initial study with fewer participants to get a better idea. Yeah, certainly you could you could certainly do this, but it's something that was maybe even a headline in a former lecture not long ago. You could do a literature review. Also, yes, yes. So that's a great idea, uh, and kind of along the same lines. You could think of theory, right? That would describe and inform the possible uh, variation points there. Uh, and I don't know, for example, if um, I uh, have or, or know of some theory that describes, uh, I don't know, demographic differences in how people uh, use computing technology, then I would want to make sure to uh, sample and recruit a demographically diverse set of participants for my interview study to hope to capture this sort of theoretically expected diversity. That makes sense? So you know, theory, lit reviews, that kind of thing uh, could help kind of inform the sampling strategy a priori. Um, alternatively, you, um, if you don't have any of this, or you know, even if you do, um, you still probably want to stop interviewing people at some point. Um, and so this is the second criterion that's important here, the, the saturation criterion. It's called theoretical saturation or saturation of information. The point of this is, uh, say you have, uh, I don't know, interviewed 20 people and have analyzed all of this data and have built your, your theory or something, have learned something from this. 
um, you should ask yourself, right? And actually, you know, along the way, remember, because analysis and data collection sort of happen hand in hand in parallel, right? It's not sort of one that happens after the other. Um, at every point where you do some analysis, you have an opportunity to ask yourselves, am I learning anything new? Right? So, so say compared to the first round of interviews that I've analyzed from the second round that I've just conducted, did I learn anything new from the second round or am I just seeing more of the same things over and over again? Okay. Um, and this is sort of when you decide to stop Right. You decide to stop when you're not learning anything new, when the new people that you're interviewing are expressing more of the same views that you've already seen from the people who've in interviewed earlier. Okay. So this is called theoretical saturation. Saturation is the keyword here. You've reached saturation, meaning you're not learning anything new in your insights, in your findings. Okay. And that's when you stop. Um, one way in which I've seen this implemented that I liked in a research paper was to say, um, we stop the researchers that, that or authors of that paper of the study said that they had stopped after the last, I don't know, five consecutive interviews have not yielded any new insights. All right, so you could think of you know, having this five interview window that you keep sliding and you're analyzing the data as you're collecting it and you know, whenever you have, in, in their case, five consecutive interviews that have not yielded any new, new insights, they decided to stop. They, they decided to call that saturation. Right? So it's subjective, it's a judgment call, but you could sort of use an objective criterion like the one I, I just gave as an example to make that subjective call for, for when to stop. Does that make sense? So this is actually important because this comes up a lot in reviews. Um, you, well, so obviously you want to satisfy yourselves uh, that that you have, you know, discovered everything that was to discover. So if you um, if you stop before you get a chance to uh, learn everything there was about that particular thing you're uh, you're interviewing people about, then you're you're missing out. That's obvious. But also, like reviewers will sort of ask for this. They will want, they, people expect the, the standard of rigor for interview studies is such that people expect so to, to reach, to see theoretical saturation in these uh, qualitative studies using interviews. And um, you, you, know, you ought to have a good reason not to do that. Uh, and sort of it's an uphill battle to get stuff published if you don't do something like that. Okay, um, right, a few more sort of practical things here. Um, I guess, so, you know, all of these things have to do with how do you reach people, right? So like, if you're interviewing, I don't know, underage students, um, I don't know, high school students, middle school students, whatever, you need to access them through some formal gatekeepers, people at the respective schools and their parents, in, in this case, um, or if you're, I don't know, interviewing prisoners or whatever, um, employees at a company, right, to sort of need some, you need to go through some formal gatekeeper that will kind of give you access to, to these people. Um, that's unavoidable. Sometimes there's also informal gatekeepers or sort of people with, um, with influence in a certain community. Um, it's good to try to recruit them. So for example, if you have a like, high profile practitioner or something, uh, getting them to participate in your study as useful because that sort of signals to other people that you know this is something that's maybe worth participating in as well, right? If, if they see somebody um, they they look up to or, or recognize that has already participated, so that's that's an informal gatekeeper, if you will. Uh, you know, having this person on board uh, would likely bring in other people as well on board, um, and it's better to sort of reach people uh, at, the, at the same peer level rather than sort of above or below because you get a better chance of having an honest, truthful conversation with them. If it's sort of through some, uh, I don't know, uh, position of hierarchy, um, if I ask, not that I am in a position of hierarchy, but if I ask my students to participate in some study, 
um, then they might just feel pressured to do this versus if, if their friends ask them to participate in a study or their colleagues at a different university, they don't have to be with their friends. Actually, it's better if they're not, if they're not their friends. Uh, if it's their peers, then you know, it's maybe a more uh, genuine um, account of their experience. Let's see. Oh yeah, so this was the friend's comment that I just made. It's best to avoid interviewing easy access subjects because they might um, take a lot of things for granted um, that they would assume and so on that you already know lots of things and you will assume that they already know lots of things uh, and you won't get sort of as, uh, there's not enough distance between you and them to uh, really get at um, the, the core of these issues and they might also not be inclined to be uh, entirely honest with you about their experience and so on. So best to avoid these easy access subjects if you can. Um, yeah, the, of course, this is there's a great example paper that I'll ask you to look at for, uh, for next time. Um, that, um, that was an interview study um, of sex workers in Germany and Switzerland, I think. So that's a sort of a, a scenario where uh, confidentiality and ensuring the confidentiality of your uh, study participants is super important. And so that's something that you have to um, think about a lot, especially for sort of sensitive populations like that. All right, so that's kind of um, about sampling and recruiting. So now how do you actually do this? What do you actually do when you're, when you're doing this? So here's roughly the um, interview process, the process of actually conducting the interview. Here's sort of the different steps part of this process. Um, so let's start with the first, like how do you motivate your participants? So this has to do with two things. You wanna motivate them to, first of all, participate in your study, right? So these are very basic things, you know, um, for example, just be very clear about what the purpose of this interview is, um, how that relates to the, your participants' work and their goals and their values and so on, um, what they expect to get out of this, what you expect to get out of this, uh, things like that, what is required to participate. So just sort of very basic practical things like this, but you have to make them explicit and you have to have to communicate them. Um, like how you're gonna use this information, right? So all of these things you have to think about in advance, you have to have answers ready for, and you have to communicate them to your participants in order to motivate them to, to participate, right? If I get an invitation to participate in a study and um, I don't get any indication that people have sort of um, thought about any of these, or there's no communication about how they're gonna use that information, how they're gonna store my data, whatever, um, uh, I'm very, unlikely to, to want to participate in that. That's kind of getting people to participate. The other part of this is uh, getting, motivating people to produce useful information, to give you useful information. So again, these are very basic things. So, you know, just create an, an atmosphere, a welcoming, safe environment in which people feel um, safe to communicate fully uh, and they do not fear uh, being judged or criticized by you or anyone on the, the research team um, and so provide them with this space to um, uh, communicate freely and openly and, and honestly about their experience and safely uh, and you know provide them with reinforcement on the process and so on feedback on how they're doing things like this so again very very basic things but um, do not take these for granted Right, here's a set of questions that it's good to have answers for as you're uh, recruiting participants and engaging with them. But why are you doing this, right? So you have to be able to articulate to your participants what the point of the study is, what you expect to get out of this, uh, what your employer expects to get out of this, what they can expect to get out of this, who's paying for all of this, if they'll see the results of this, if they'll see their data, how long this will take, um, if there's going to be any um, uh, downside or risk associated with them participating, um, why them? This is a super common question. Why have you selected them? 
like why why that person why not their uh, i don't know colleague or their neighbor or what have you right? and why, why is it what's special about that person um, right why do you need to interview them and not someone else so these are the kinds of things that it's good to have answers for All right so this is kind of getting people to motivating them to participate and to engage as part of the interview so um, then how do you ask questions this is important so um, here's some sort of best practices and um, less good practices let's start with things to avoid this applies to interview guides, applies to survey instruments, applies to so anywhere where you have to phrase, applies to research questions, really. So um, avoid asking multiple questions at once. I think we talked about this and a bit about research questions, but this also applies to interview guides and survey instruments and whatnot. For example, do not do this. Um, why did you join this open source project and do you think it has brought benefits to your programming experience? Um, do not do this because so it's multiple questions in one. It's unclear what the participant should answer from this. You know, if you expect answers to both of these, to some of these, by the time you uh, ask all of this, they will have forgotten parts of the question and so on. So just do not do this. Ask simple, short, uh, specific questions about one at, item at a time. Um, super important, avoid leading questions. For example, remember Stu Dent? From, I don't know, a, a couple of lectures ago, Stu had built this um, AI that took in natural language and uh, produced source code snippets so people wouldn't have to write programs anymore. They could just sort of describe uh, the intent in English. So, for example, Stu could ask some um, uh, interviewees So, you felt that using NL to code improved your productivity, right? This is a very leading question because it's sort of implies this expectation that uh, the tool was helpful and, and, and beneficial, right? So do not do this. Instead, ask uh, neutral questions. For example, uh, for the same question, you could ask, what, if any, impact did this tool have on your productivity? So this is a, a neutral formulation of the same question. There's no implicit, um, preference of, of yours, the interviewer, uh, for one direction versus the other. You're asking, what if any? Could be, could be none, right? That's a perfectly acceptable answer. Or more examples. Um, your parents pushed you to study, didn't they? The leading question. Or how satisfied were you with NL2 code? Okay. There's no, the, the, it's, implicit here that you have to have been satisfied with NL2 code. You cannot be unsatisfied, right? There's no option to be unsatisfied. You can only be satisfied uh, to a great extent or to a lesser extent, but satisfied nonetheless. You cannot be unsatisfied, okay? So this is why this is a leading question. How would you rephrase this to make it more neutral? I guess for for how satisfied were you with uh, L2 code? I can rephrase it like, what was your experience like with L2 code? More open ended, uh, less implicit preference. Yes, that that's a great example. Um, uh, another way of doing this would be to say to uh, a bi it's called a bipolar uh, formulation of the same questions. You could say so, meaning both poles are represented in the question. You could say how satisfied or dissatisfied were you with NL2 code, right? There's no, maybe from the order, right? There's some sort of implicit preference. You're listing one first, but it's much weaker. You're, you're, you know, both seem, um, seem like perfectly acceptable ways of, of, of answering. How satisfied or dissatisfied were you with NL2 code? Or what was your experience with NL2 code? These are much more neutral formulations of the same question that do not lead the uh, interviewee in a certain direction. Do you see that? Okay, here's more. Um, avoid assuming that 
the answer to a question is so obvious that it, it need not be asked. So this kind of comes back to that point I was trying to make earlier about avoiding um, easy access set of interviewees, if you can, that, that's where that can have an impact. This is where that can have an impact. So um, for example, the question could be um, whether and to what extent are you concerned about your privacy online? Again, note the neutral formulation. Whether, right, this implies that you might not be at all. And to what extent, so there's different levels. If, if at all, there's different levels. So it's a much more neutral formulation. I am not implying a certain preferred answer here. Um, but, right, you might, if, if you're interviewing um, graduate students in Scilab, right, you might not even think to ask this. Uh, or um, uh, because the answer is so obvious, because of course they're studying, they're studying privacy uh, and security online. That's what they do. It's, it's what their research is all about. So of course they're concerned about this. It, it's, they're spending their, uh, you know, every waking minute thinking about this, right? So you might not even ask them that. Um, it's best to avoid assuming that the answer is obvious, right? So for example, here, an assumption that the answer is obvious would have been to, to um, it, let me rephrase. If you had asked the question differently, if you had asked, how much are you concerned about your privacy online, that had the uh, implicit assumption built in that you are concerned about your privacy online. Whereas um, that's, you should not take that for granted, right? It's, it may seem obvious to you, it did not be obvious to your uh, participants. Okay, people might just not be concerned. Other kinds of people might not be concerned, other groups of people, okay? Um, another one, avoid imposing your perception. So let's say somebody has uh, given you an answer to one of your questions. Uh, you might have this natural tendency to try to summarize and synthesize what they've said uh, in, in, in the following way. Uh, so what you're really saying is this, right? So this kind of um, superimposes your um, interpretation, your perception of what they said, rather than the, rather than um, extracting their own. Okay. So avoid doing this. Avoid imposing your own perceptions of the problem, the expected answers, the whatnot. When you're when you're doing interviews and try to get at the participants' perceptions and impressions and views and experiences, not your own. Okay? This is why it's so hard to do interviews well because because it's so easy to be so biased as a as a human interviewer in in some of these ways. Uh, here's another one. Um, don't end the interview on any topic of any difficulty, um, it, you know, that's difficult, could be sort of emotionally uh, charging or difficult, it could be just difficult otherwise. So avoid doing this because that's sort of the experience that participants leave the study with. So the last thing you get to talk about. So, you know, if you absolutely have to have these uh, discussions, if they're part of your study, you know, have them somewhere else throughout, but end on a positive note. Uh, and like we uh, mentioned earlier, by giving them the opportunity to make any comments about the subject, um, to uh, tell you what else uh, you should have asked about, that, but you haven't perhaps. Uh, for example, you know, you can ask what else, if anything, should I have asked, and you can have a conversation about things that they feel are important, but you didn't think of, of asking about. Uh, just to avoid difficult topics at the end, and with sort of lighter things and end on a positive note. Okay, so then these are all things to avoid. What are some things to do? What are some good things to do? Well, obviously, you know, the opposites of the things to avoid, but also other things. Um, so ask simple questions directly in a clear manner that kind of talks to some of the previous things. Do be flexible, right? So the, the guide is only meant as a guide. It's not meant as a, I don't know, a, a perfect uh, template or form or whatever. You're, um, 
topics and order and so on can change and evolve during the interviews. And that's on purpose, that's expected as part of the method. That's why the method is so powerful because it allows for this flexibility. Um, oh yeah, do open. So just like, you know, don't end with some difficult topic. Do start with uh, questions, at least a question that can be answered easily and without potential embarrassment or distress by the participants. Um, and these can be just sort of uh, requests for factual or descriptive information. You could ask them to, I don't know, describe their uh, role with the company or, or something. So just factual information like this, something that's very easily, uh, easily answerable and um, has little risk of causing uh, embarrassment or stress. All right, um, ask open-ended questions. Um, roughly two kinds of open-ended questions, the so-called grand tour questions. For example, um, take me through a day in your work life. Uh, take me through the, the last uh, session you spent on this particular website. And so walk me through everything you did in, in this last session or, or reconstruct your day for me from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed. Right, this is sort of a grand tour question because you asked them to walk you through uh, some uh, lengthy experience. Walk me through your entire career uh, from your first job to your retirement. Um, that's an example of a grand tour type question. Um, that's a one common open-ended question. It needn't be this grand, right? So don't, you know, don't think that you have to ask about their entire careers. It could be about, for example, their last session, uh, uh, I don't know, br browsing some website or something. Um, or alternatively, there's the so-called so subjective experience questions that are also open-ended, like what was attending this class like for you? What was using NL to code like for you? This is a subjective experience, open-ended question. You're not um, implying some possible expected answer here. Okay, uh, do follow up to what the participant says. The, again, the strength of the method is in sort of having these deep, rich conversations. Uh, and unless you sort of follow up and engage, um, you will only get sort of answers to maybe your top level questions, but you won't get a chance to dive deeper. So, you know, ask for details, for clarifications, for stories, that's always great. Uh, and do trust your instincts, right? So this kind of develops with practice. Your interviewer instincts will also develop with practice. And if you feel like there's something interesting, uh, a new direction that's emerging, by all means, uh, you know, start exploring that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this. Uh, trust your instincts and, and explore emerging topics. Oh, um, ask participants to reconstruct, if possible, rather than remember their experience. This uh, is the same conversation we had at the beginning. You can assume that people uh, have uh, forgotten everything. Uh, we know this uh, from psychology and whatnot, that people's memory is very unreliable. So don't ask people to remember things because their memory of things is very unreliable, uh, but rather ask them to sort of reconstruct things uh, that's slightly more reliable. Uh, so for example, um, you could ask, what happened in this particular instance versus do you remember what happened in this particular instance? So just, just this very subtle linguistic difference in uh, how these two questions, essentially the same question are, are phrased, can have an impact on kind of the, um, uh, the mechanisms that people use to, uh, to answer the question. If you ask them to remember, it sort of triggers memory and, and fabulation more than um, it, it does reconstruction. Uh, right, so ask for concrete details. Uh, whenever you do this, ask for concrete things, uh, examples, details, whatever, concrete instances of things, just to um, reduce the risk of people making stuff up. They will, they will always invariably make stuff up, but this sort of helps reduce that risk. All right. Um, so that's about asking, uh, then listening and understanding. So listening means um, you know, attending to verbal and nonverbal cues, 
being an actual conversation partner, not just a robot asking questions, um, uh, attending to um, both facts and feelings and you know, responding actively, being empathetic, things like this. Understanding means uh, putting yourself in the interviewee's frame of reference and, and being understanding and empathetic and non-judgmental uh, and so not jumping prematurely to uh, conclusions. Uh, you do this after the interviews, but not during the interview, right? Avoid jumping to conclusions during the interview. You have a plenty of chance afterwards to analyze this data and to think about uh, what it means. Um, to summarize this sort of in, in one catchy phrase, listen more and talk less would be the idea here. Um, so you can think of listening at three levels. Um, it's like one level of listening has to do with the substance of the um, conversation you're having. Uh, right? So you obviously have to internalize what the participants are saying, the actual uh, information they're communicating, the facts and so on. That's the substance. But also listen for the inner voice versus outer voice uh, communication. But for example, um, again, because you know people are human, uh, interviewees are human, you'll see people talking about how something was challenging or something was an adventure or how they're fascinated by something. Um, this is sort of the outer voice. This is the kind of language you would use um, to um, package up your uh, feelings in a more so societally acceptable, socially acceptable way when you're communicating with other people. Uh, whereas, you know, deep down inside, you might be really, really annoyed by something. Like if I say something was a challenge, it's sort of one positive uh, way of saying that I, uh, I'm struggling, right? So you know, listen for these things, right? So listen for what the people are saying with their outer voice versus what they're probably uh, thinking, you know, on the inside with their inner voice. And, and finally, you know, listening for kind of, uh, you have to pay attention to the process. You have to assess how far along in the interview you are and so stay alert for cues and move the interview forward and all of these, uh, these things have to do with just managing the interview itself. Three levels of listening that have to happen. Um, and so how do you know if you're achieving this? It's, it's really hard. Again, like it's really hard to do this well. I, um, I, I am a terrible interviewer, but uh, I sort of have developed this appreciation for how hard it is by trying to do this myself. Um, so how can you um, see, uh, check your, your progress on these? So one way is to listen to yourself in recordings uh, and or to check the length of your paragraphs in, in transcripts. You could look for so how much listening you did versus how much talking you did. Right? And that's one way of kind of um, checking yourself, controlling yourself. Okay, um, probing. So probing, remember, uh, there's some topics, high-level topics perhaps, that uh, kind of started the discussion in some particular direction. And then you sort of follow up with, with these probes. They could be directive. So uh, directing people at, at, at something. Um, for example, uh, what were the major responsibilities of your most recent job? That's sort of a, an, it's an open-ended probe but it's, it's directed at a particular uh, set of information or, or topic. So the pe person's responsibilities at their, uh, at their job. But it's open-ended, you're, you're not implying uh, anything here. Um, we also have more specific probes. So for example, somebody says, uh, an interviewee says, uh, I've always had the ability to learn a new programming language quickly. So you could follow up uh, with a probe to this. Uh, for example, what specific steps do you take to learn a new language? So this is sort of asking for specific examples of things. Okay? So they're saying, it's easy for me to learn a new programming language. You're asking you know, how specifically, like what specific steps do you take to do that? Or um, uh, you're you know, asking, for example, uh, how would you rate your contributions to this open source project? And they might say, uh, I, I think I'm a major contributor to this project. Uh, 
Um, so then you could ask again for specific instances, specific things. Okay, you can say, you know, I'm glad to hear this. It's nice, uh, but what contributions in particular made you feel this way? Could you give me some examples of, of, of what your contributions have been that make you feel like you have been a major contributor? For example, um, or you could have a bipolar probe. We talked about bipolar questions before, so. Um, most people I talked to uh, can identify aspects of working remotely. They really like, that's one poll, and aspects, other aspects of working remotely that they dislike, that's the other poll, right? And you're mentioning both polls, right? So as not to bias their answer in one direction or another. Um, and then you say, would you tell me about those aspects that you really like? And then they tell you about this. And then you sort of repeat this bipolar probe and you ask them the uh, follow-up question, would you tell me about those aspects that you really dislike and the sort of next follow-up, okay? Um, or you could have an elaboration probe. Okay. So you could ask, is there anything else you would like to tell me? Uh, what else can you think about? Are there any, do you have any other thoughts about this? These were directive. You could also have non-directive probes where you kind of reflect their feelings back to them. For example, somebody might say, I've been here for 15 years uh, and I don't feel like I've been treating fairly. Uh, and you could sort of reflect their feelings back and you could say, you feel you haven't been treated fairly. So that prompts them to you know, describe deeper their uh, feelings about why they've, uh, they've not been treated fairly. Um, you could also have indirect follow-ups. So just you know, simple things like, please tell me more. I'd like to hear more about this point. Could you elaborate a bit and so on? Uh, finally, pause. This is one of the greatest teaching hacks there is. If I'm asking a question to, I don't know, a lecture room full of students, the often a, a good way to pry out answers from people is to just introduce a long, awkward pause. Because that will force people to, it's really awkward, right? It's like, you know, you're, especially when you're in person, you're like looking at each other and so on. And uh, the instructor, the lecturer has asked something uh, and um, they're expecting an answer and like no, nobody's volunteering. The longer that they wait, the more awkward it becomes and the more likely it is that so somebody will sort of volunteer an, an answer. Okay, so this also works for interviews. Uh, it's the same principle. All right, so we're running short on time. So let me, um, we will, um, I guess, I, I won't go over this. I wanna go over kind of the data, data analysis part of, 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 of interviews, um, but please, so uh, two things for, for you. So please uh, take a look at, I'll publish the slides after class. Please take a look at the remaining slides in the deck to kind of uh, go through the rest of the, the points here. Um, and I'd like you to, um, Think about the following um, for Thursday. Um, let's see. There is an activity I was planning on doing in class, but we um, I, I took too long to go over this, so we won't have time. But this is the activity. I want to ask you to um, come up with a short interview guide for a short 15-20 minute interview. Uh, so imagine your uh, research goal is to understand how and why people collaborate on, on writing papers as opposed to writing papers on their own. Uh, so you know, this could be for lots of reasons. Maybe you're just so interested in collaboration in the workplace, uh, you're studying that. Maybe you're building a tool like Overleaf or whatever um, for people to collaborate on writing papers more effectively. Um, you know, whatever the motivation might be, put yourself in this in this scenario and develop a short interview protocol. Uh, so imagine about 15, 20 minute interviews 
um, using all of these techniques that you've seen in lecture today, uh, you know, keeping the interviewees focused on concrete tasks and so on. Um, and um, so an, an interview protocol for a study that you would do, right, depending on what your motivation is, you can, you know, you're free to choose uh, whichever ones of these resonates with you the most. Um, but so come up with a set of, with an interview guide, a set of uh, prompts uh, and, and questions and topics that would sort of cover roughly 15 to 20 minute interviews uh, on this topic. Uh, and um, let's talk about those at the beginning of class on, uh, on the Thursday briefly. So uh, think about this before Thursday, if you can. You're welcome to do this in, in pairs or, or groups. Okay. So I guess what I'm trying to do is sort of force you to think about the different progression of questions and prompts in an interview and force you to think about phrasing questions and in all of these um, ways that we talked about in, in class today to you know, reduce biases and so on. Okay, so that's it. Sorry for keeping you late again. I'll see you on Thursday.